We are in your hands. Thank you for agreeing to take part in this very important program of Calvary Methodist Church. You may now take over and lead us in the manner that the Spirit guides you. All right. Um, all right. Um, thank you very much, um, Fundisi. <laughs> I must say that I did not expect this um, this clip that is my wife on. Um, you know how to um, revive the spirit in a way, um, because most of the time, every time when I'm about to embark on such a mission she is always my prayer warrior she's the one that always lifts me up in spirit and Umfum Sustemele actually um, was my local minister whom um, I started my journey with um, of ministry in, in Cape Town so yeah these are the two most important people in my life and my journey basically thank you so much greetings to you Umfundisi uh, greetings to you Umfundisi Umajela Greetings to Abefundis Bonke Abakona Apa um, Nabali Vayo Elizulam and greetings to everyone here on this platform and those who might be watching on the other mediums uh, like Facebook and other stuff. <coughs> it is a beautiful Saturday afternoon here in Queenstown. Um, Funisu Klamza, I'm here with my uh, with my colleague and my deacon in the second, O Tikoni O Mr. Umponzi. He is also joining us here in support um, of, of this session. I'm, I'm very grateful for that as well. Um, uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, and now, Mfundisi O Majela, Ngogutike Nitika Nitenga Oguti, Nifumane Umdu Ozao Vala, Oganyo Zao, Oza Gwenza, the last part of what you guys have been doing over time. Uh, I've been following the sessions and in following the sessions over the past week both on here on Zoom and on um, on YouTube I must say that um, there's quite a lot of work that has been done and there's quite a lot of um, spiritual um, deliver, deliverance if I may or spiritual emancipation that was going on here just about every speaker that took part in this um, captured my my spirit and captured my attention on this um, prayer that is the Lord's prayer and I'm hoping that Abazalwani um, gained as much as I did, um, which therefore means um, uh, today I I in fact I I have the sense that there is no stone left unturned on just about everything that has to do with um, this Lord's Prayer. And so, and so if then that is the case, what am I to do here? Um, is just that if you find me repeating things that were said over the week by Mfunsu Kamza, Mfunsu Majela, Mfunsu Jojo, Mfunsu Tukule, and everyone else that took part, just take it as a reminder of what they were saying. Just take it as that the Spirit is reminding you of what um, you, need, you needed to hear over the past week. Um, I will also not be doing any summary um, because there's no need for doing a summary. I will only um, be, be attempting to do a brief exposition on the last part of the Lord's Prayer. I text Mfunsu Kamza Izolo um, and said to him, Mdambo, what is it exactly that you want me to do? Because this that you want me to do is not in the Bible. And so, um, and, and um, I'm here, if I may, to confuse you deliberately, actually. And also that we always approach topics like this with the intention to teach and then find ourselves preaching. And in my mind, I've always battled with these two concept, concepts, preaching and teaching, that, okay, maybe preaching appeals to the soul and the spirit and the inner being, and maybe teaching appeals to the mind and the conscience and, 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 and the intellect of the being. 
However, um, I found no easy answer as to what is it exactly is the difference between teaching and preaching. And so my conclusion is always that we teach to preach and preach to teach. So if you find me preaching instead of teaching or teaching instead of preaching, you must know that um, those two for me are quite um, interlinked and there's a fine line between the two. Um, in any event, let me start by saying, I don't know if there's anyone that has found this passage in the Bible in his or her version. Uh, please feel free to text it um, in, the, in, the, in the text box here. Yes, please feel free to send me a, or send us a, a chat and say, I found it on my Bible and it is this version that I'm reading. Because um, as an aspiring preacher, I was taught that you should never have one version of the Bible um, in your study or in your bookshelf or something like that. And so, um, I have about six uh, different types of Bibles in my study. And I could not find the words, for thine is thy kingdom, thy power, and thy glory forever and ever. Amen. In all the the, the, the the five versions that I have. I went through Matthew chapter 6. It's not there. I went through Luke chapter 11. It's not there. Mark is even saying something that I don't even know whether it is actually the Lord's prayer or not. And so, and so my departing point here is that this line, for thy is thy kingdom, thy power and the glory forever. Amen. It may just be, and that also scholars agree, that it may have not been on the original prayer that Jesus taught. The original prayer that Jesus taught is recorded twice. It is recorded on Matthew 6, which was part of the, the, the teaching on the mount, the sermons on the mount, Remember, Matthew chapter 5 is the Beatitudes, and Matthew chapter 6, then you will find Jesus teaching the multitudes how to pray. And then he says, you should pray like this and not like that. And then this line is not included. And then on Luke chapter 11, again, Christ responds to a request by the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. And so when the disciples asked him, he then taught them the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, thy, will, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as on earth as it is in heaven. You go on and on and on and on. And so again, in, the, in my five versions, this line for thine is thy kingdom, thy power and thy glory uh, forever. Amen. Is not included. And that caught my attention. I only found it in the very most contemporary version, which is translated by John C. Maxwell from the King James Version, that is the KJV. And so the NIV, the NRSV, and the uh, English Standard Bible, and NSV, and all those others do not include this. But then John C. Maxwell, who first documented the version that I have in 1982, that caught my attention. Um, why is it that um, this line is not necessarily um, included in many of the versions that we have? And upon my curiosity, I then researched and went through other um, uh, supporting literature on, on the exposition and commentary of the Bible. And then um, I came across this thing that says, this last line, for thine is thy kingdom, thy power, and thy glory, is what is called in theological terms doxology. It is called doxology. And so doxology is the word derived from the Greek word, um, which is now a combination of, do of doxa. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sorry. 
And so, and so the, 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 the word doxology, as I'm saying that this line itself is, is, is in theological terms called doxology. I wouldn't want to really bore you by big words of the Bible. However, I feel that it is important that we understand this part about this line, as I'm arguing that it is not in many of the versions that I've read. And I, I challenge you, friends, um, that if you find it in your own version, please help us and tell us which version is that. Is that. Um, it, it is doxology, meaning that doxa means glory, right? It means glory. And then logia, in simple terms, um, it is a saying, okay? Saying, that is logia, it is saying, okay? And so, and so um, doxology, therefore, means um, it is the saying of praise, or saying of exaltation, of saying of glorification, uh, a saying that it is in the same way as we say, um, meaning that in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in every time that we pray, uh, we say these things in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. And so that's doxology, meaning that that's the words of, of, of exaltation, that's the words of glorification, that's the words of, of, of praising and lifting up God as the supreme being. And so in this case, what is lifted up here, it is the kingdom of God, it is the power of God, it is uh, the glory of God. And in fact, you will find this even in the beginning when this um, prayer is open, our Father who art in heaven, meaning that above everyone else, right? Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done because you are the supreme being. And I'm, I said it earlier on that, should I repeat some of the things that were said, just take them as a, as a reminder. And so many scholars agree that this line for thine is thy kingdom, thy power and thy glory was not in the orig original prayer taught by Jesus on both accounts recorded in the Bible. Be that as it may, the line in question, therefore, is the conclusion, right, of what is commonly known now as we, as we know it, now the Lord's Prayer. And so I submit that um, um, in, in itself, it is something that is self-explanatory. I don't know if we really need to spend too much time trying to wrestle with this and right because it is self-explanatory. It says what it is and what it should be. And therefore, let me let me let me move on then by saying um, the earliest New Testament sources, right? The earliest New Testament sources found this line on the manuscripts, on the Greek manuscripts, okay, which were put together and tried to find out what well, they were fading away, tried to find out and included them. And then we found them from the King James Version. Um, now, Greek manuscript, manuscripts, the KJV, the King James, King James Version, that to me again signaled another point of interest um, of the two eras as to why was there a need for the scribes and authors to include this part in the end for thine is thy kingdom thy power and thy glory forever and ever amen right and so and so and so in my mind right in my mind i wish to put it to you friends and everyone that is listening to me that every time when you read the bible Every time when you read the Bible, you must understand this, that there is not even a single word that is put in there by mistake or just for the sake of it. That's why when we're doing exegesis, if those are preachers are here, that's why when we're doing exegesis, it is much um, acceptable that you would just take one word in a verse and do an exposition on it and expound on it and interpret that word. And so you must always approach scripture with that mentality, with reason, with experience and also um, 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 aligned with your tradition. These are the sources of, of, of doing theology. You take the scripture, you read the scripture, you reason, why is this not in the Bible? And why was it included in the Bible? Why in this era? Why by the Greeks and why by the, by the, by the King James era? Okay, So that when you read 
in the scripture. You don't write, just read it literally as it is, but you find meaning into it that speaks to you, find meaning into it that speaks to your context, and find meaning into it that speaks to your fellow pilgrims and all those kind of things. And so the constructions of, of, of this thing, of this line um, to be particular, was then put together in the 8th and the 9th century by the first Greeks um, uh, discovered from the Greek manuscripts and then the KJV. Once again, looking at, at these two eras, the Greek era and the KJV era, that is the King James era, you will realize that it was a highly political era of the time. Okay, It was a highly political era of the time. And so for the Greeks to be able to colonize everyone, and make Greek the main language as opposed to Hebrew, there has there had to be to be some conquering happening. Okay, let me quickly get to the point. Now, now, now the mention of the kingdom and the power and the and the glory in this particular line, and in fact in this entire prayer, places emphasis on God as being the supreme being above everything. You would remember if we talk about the kingdom, you will remember in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when, when, when Samuel was getting old, he appointed his son to take over the reins of, of, his, of, of his leadership. And, and, and the people of Israel did not like the idea because his sons did not do what their father had taught them and so did not lead as they were expecting them to lead you know they went astray they lead they did a lot of funny things and stuff like that and so the the man the elders of of, of the nation at the time went to the prophet or to Samuel and said appoint us a king who will rule over us Sinike Zukumkani Ozausi Pata. First Samuel chapter 8. That's where the biggest problem of, of kingship started in the Jewish nation. And so from that point onwards, God was not very happy. Was not happy at all or pleased at all, actually. And so he went to the he, he spoke to, to, to Samuel and said to him, If they want a king, Listen to their voice because they are not fighting with you. They are fighting with me as their God, right? They, they, they are undermining the power that I have over them and so want to appoint for themselves a physical being, a mortal being who will rule over them. But warn them that when they have this king, he will then take advantage of them. He will abuse them. He will impose taxes on them. He will rule with the iron fist and stuff like that. And the rest is history of the Israelites' um, 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 historical background. However, I want to I want to move on towards this as I'm as I'm getting to this point that. For thine is the kingdom, right? Now I want to get on to this. After they had a king, I, I have lost the count of the breakaways that happened from that kingship, right? From the first kingship, from some, I, I've lost the count, but there were many breakaways. The northern, the southern, the western, and the eastern kingship. That is not important at the moment. Be that as it may, once again, that after their first request of the king that was given to them, they got into trouble over trouble over trouble over trouble. They were conquered by the Babylonian kings and taken to captive to Babylon. While they were in Babylon, they were taken. Babylon was attacked by Assyria and then uh, Assyria captured Babylon, who had captured Israel, right? Over and above that, Persia flexed their power and then overcame Assyria, who had held captive Babylon. And Babylon had held captive of, of Israel. And then um, after the Persian uh, kingdom, right, which was ruling now over the nations, all the nations, we closed the Old Testament, I'm appealing to the mind now, friends. Um, I don't know if I said that in Funi Um and I, I wouldn't much um, try to appeal to your to your spiritual being and all those kind of things. I, I I need you to reason and think with me as I'm trying to expound on this thing. Okay, and so and so when you close the Old Testament, you close the Old Testament while the Jewish nation 
and every other kingdom was under the rule of the Persian kings, okay? That is the foreign kings. And then you move into the New Testament, that is Matthew now. In Matthew, you find a different transition, meaning that there was a, an intertestament period that there were activities happening because in the New Testament, we no longer find the Persians whom we have closed within the Old Testament. We find the Greeks and the Romans in coalition of power, meaning that the Hellenistic period. And so Greeks and Rome conquered all these other nations and then took over the reigns and the kingship of the people of Israel. Hence the veneration of Caesar, hence the veneration of Herod, hence the veneration of many others, including uh, Opilato and stuff like that, because were no longer in the hands of their own kings. Okay. It was no longer in the hands of their own kings. It was in the hands of the foreign rulers. And so the issue of the emergence of Jesus in the New Testament, right? Um, it is it is perceived and taken as a political issue, okay? As a political issue. And so taken as a political issue, the people of Israel had hoped that Christ would become their next king. And so when Christ becoming their next king, the first thing Christ had to teach them was that I am not here for the kingdom of this world. I am here for the kingdom of the heavens. And so when he teaches them to pray, once again, he teaches them against the prayers that he found happening in the synagogues, that he arrived in the synagogue when the priests and everyone else was praying, right, was praying in a fashionable manner, was praying in a recitable manner, was praying in a manner that, that, that then required you to behave in a certain way for your prayer to be accepted, okay? And so teaching on the mount, he was teaching an antithesis of what was happening in the Jewish political area era and in the Jewish religious and spiritual era. Hence the B attitude. Blessed are those which were then in contravention and contrary to what was taught in the church of the time, right? To what was taught in the church of the time. And so when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, he, he, he was trying to say to them, this kingdom that you are yearning for, right? This kind of spirituality that you are yearning for, this kind of political will that you are yearning for, I am not here for that. There is a supreme being that you need to pray towards. And then he says in Matthew 5, in Matthew 6, that when you pray, when you pray, don't pray to please the people. Don't pray to appease your rulers. Don't pray to bow down on Caesar. Remember, Caesar was deified at the moment. Don't pray to impress the rulers of the time. Pray to converse with a supreme being who is all-powerful, who is all-present, who is all-providence, who is all-everything. And so if Jesus was teaching that. He was teaching the people not to focus on things that are seen because the things that are seen are perishable and more so the kingdom that they were yearning for was not the kingdom that was to deliver them. The kingdom that he, they had hoped Jesus Christ would then uh, overthrow and conquer. It's not the kingdom he had come from but there is a kingdom that was supreme higher than the other. And so you must always have this thing in mind that if you are to understand the concept of the kingdom of God, you've got to first understand this thing that our interpretation and our comprehension of who God is, is an anthropocentric kind of our understanding and so our idea of God it is very small to an extent that we interpret and view God by things that are tangible by things that can be seen by things that are around us by the freedom that we have by the captivity that we find ourselves in and stuff like this our interpretation of God is based on who is in power in who is in political power at the moment if then the one who is in power does not do 
what we please, then God has des deserted us. If we don't find things that we want, and then kick our spoon, if we are not happy in the kingdom as it were, then it means that God is no longer with us. However, Jesus says that we need to have a higher level of thinking and a higher level of comprehension in that the one whom owns the kingdom, meaning that God's kingdom is the one whom who is Alpha and Omega, even all the rulers of the world bow down, in fact, should bow down to him. That's the first point that I, 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 I need to make. Meaning that um, understand the, the, the political context of the time, okay? And so, and so, why this doxology in, in this, in this, in this, in this, um, in this line? Now, the first that I've just articulated now is in relation to the political context of when Jesus was teaching this prayer. I suspect perhaps someone will disagree with me or have a different view. Maybe Omfunisu Kamza and Omfunisu Machelas will have a different theology. Even the King James Version, remember it was coined from a, it was a reinterpreted from a Latin version. Latin, in fact, from, from, I think it was Takums, if I'm not mistaken. Then there was another version before that, which was um, 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 uh, German, which was interpreted by Martin Luther. And then before that, there was um, um, then Latin. And, um, and then before that, there was Greek and, and um, uh, um, what's this thing? Hebrew, okay? There was Greek and Hebrew. And so the King James Version is the interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation of other interpretations, including the version you currently hold in your hands. And so the version you currently hold and I currently hold in, in my hands now is the reinterpretation of many other versions. And so in the reinterpretation of any passage of scripture or whatever language or book that, that they are reading, you must understand that the authors may insert comments and may delete some lines. They may put in some words, they may delete other words. And so the suspicion about this one is that during the King James Version era, remember again, Christianity was state religion in England, hence the Church of England during the time of King James, right? And so those who, who were Christian um, fellows and who had the power to interpret and reinterpret scripture for the understanding of the people, had to insert this thing to say that even this kind of kingdom that you are in at the moment is not the kingdom because it is the earthly kingdom. And so politically speaking, you might be in the earthly kingdom, but understand that whatever you're going through in this kingdom, whether persecution, whether success, whether um, fame or whatever you, wanna go, you, 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 you are going through in this kingdom, it is not a permanent or eternal kingdom. It is a temporary kingdom. Now, let's come to our era as well. Right? If you then come down to our era as to why do we accept this inclusion of doxology in the Lord's Prayer, for thine is a kingdom, thy power and thy glory, it is first and foremost to understand this, that whatever that you're striving for, anything in your life, know that you are in, in first and foremost in the kingdom of the supreme being. There is a song in, I don't know if it's his song or one of these inter, international, inter, international singers who, who sings something that says, my father may have not been a king and my mother may have not been a queen, but what I know is that I am the child of the supreme king. Meaning that even if my father is, what, is not a king or a chief or whatever that is, or even if I do not have a, a, a prominent name, or even if I do not come from an important family, and even if my mother is a, is a, is a kitchen uh, uh, cleaner or a helper at some 
um, big mansions and stuff like that. Even if I come from a poor background, even if I now live in humble beginnings, and even if no one takes care of who I am and take interest of, of what I'm doing, what I know is that my father and my creator is the supreme being. That's what this other singer says, right? I just forgot the name now, right? But, but what I'm trying to say here is that understanding this supreme being and understanding this supreme kingdom, it is that as a Christian and a born again Christian, you must understand this, that all that you are doing and all that is happening around you, in the end, God shall remain supreme above everything else. Let me move on once again. When I move on from this thing, when I'm finished with Kamsa, ne, I was interested in why Jesus found it important to teach the people on the mount. And again, again it is what I've already articulated on that there were all sorts of prayers and how we, they did church and all those kind of things that he had to teach this kind of praying. Don't fast in public. Don't tell everybody that you are fasting. Don't walk around in the courtyards showing everybody that you are praying. Uh, don't only pray. When Umfundisi says pray in church and stand up and say, Chikon di lento and diyo, di andintoyanto, manganghala nyongel sole nyama, di mumlo muntuntunda zwang, uwe chikowam, and stuff like that. And pray all sorts of prayers only when asked in church. And you even don't pray for other people, you pray for your own problems. Christ says there is a prayer that have many components which were expounded on over the week. Supreme being that is a veneration of God, God of providences, God who forgives the sins and all those kind of things. And now he, Jesus taught that when you pray, know that you exist in the supreme kingdom. Your mother and your father may not have been a king and a queen, but you are still the child in the kingdom of God. And so the disciples themselves asked for prayer, to ask to be taught how to pray. I don't know why these guys ask this. I really don't. Um, but allow me to, 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 to again raise my suspicions here about the disciples themselves. Um, it is Will Willimon who says, when Jesus found the disciples, he found them dumb. And when he left them, he left them dumber. Simply because for all the time that they were with him, they could not comprehend the higher being that he was. And they could not grasp the things that he was telling them. They could not understand the kingdom that he was teaching them about. They could not understand that Mine is not of this world, but it is of the kingdom of God. And so every time the disciples asked Jesus of anything, it was never about the interest of Christ himself. It was never about the interest of the kingdom. It was never about the interest of, 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 of the other people, actually. It was always a, a self a selfish kind of request, a self-righteous kind of request. They were forever about power, if I may. They were forever about power. What do I mean by this? Remember they asked him, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, please may I be on your left-hand side and my brother on the right-hand side. They did not succeed. When they could not succeed, they went and asked their mother to come to Jesus and say, Hey, yes, please vote, man. Please, you know, um, when you get into your kingdom, right? When you get into your kingdom, and please take John on the other side and my son on, on the other son on your left hand side. They become part of your kingdom. Remember, it was not about the, the, the godly kingdom. It was about how powerful would they become when, when Jesus Christ gets into his kingdom? They asked him, we sacrificed everything and followed you. What is in it for us? 
Singame is in the zonke, salande la wena, so Susan Tony in the laundry. And yes, again, responds to them by saying, What gain would it be to gain anything from this world and lose your lives? And now, again, I suspect in this request of the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. They had seen him doing great things. They had seen him healing the sick. They had seen him. The dead were, were raised. The deaf could hear. The blind could see. The lame could walk. And every time before Jesus performed a, a great miracle, he would go aside and pray. Every time Jesus would raise the dead, he would say, Lord, please. And they admired in my imagination how Jesus got his power. How did he become powerful? How did he gain so much following? How did the people fear him so much? How did the miracles happen so much? And so they, in my imagination, admired his sources of power. And so when they said to him, teach us to pray, I suspect that it may also have been about them becoming powerful, about them gaining popularity, about them being respected in the community, about them gaining a better position in the church, about them being having a, 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 a big congregations and stuff like that, about them whom when they would want to perform miracles, if they could have a bit of what Jesus had or knew how Jesus got his power, then they would become the, the very same powerful. And so Christ said to them, if you ever have to pray, you must know that there is the source of everything. And so when, when this part, thy power, thine, for thine is the kingdom, thy power, and the glory, it is therefore making differentiation of what could be corrupted of our hearts and seeking power that we think that is, it is for our own selves. Remember how we fight about power? Remember how politicians fight about power? Remember how ministers fight about power? Remember how lay people fight about power and positions in the church? And so this thing says here, power is not yours. Don't get obsessed with power because there is the one who, power, who, who possesses power. And so seek the one who has the power and then you shall be powerful. And so once again, that in this uh, Lucan exposition or Lucan passage, right? A power, kingdom power goes with glory. Kingdom power goes with glory, okay? And so if you then want to be powerful, you've got to be in a certain kingdom and be in a higher position. Then you have power over the weak and everyone else. And then when you have this power, then you receive is no more glory and you become the best minister. I have on to come to you. I can't go and I have the best. Some of us are in general. I have a friend's bar. I have a central. I have a district. He is the most brilliant and stuff like that. Because you, you think that when you gain access to power and forget that power corrupts absolutely and absolute power corrupts absolutely. If you get what I'm trying to say. And so, and so these guys say that power belongs to God, not to us. And so do not seek to be powerful, but submit to the one who possesses power. Okay. And so, and so let me move on once again. This whole prayer, the Lord's prayer in Fonzo Kamsa, is all about the capacitation of the saints. It is all about the capacitation of the saints. In Matthew 5, Jesus Christ seeing and evaluating what was happening in the earthly kingdom, he found it important to empower those who would follow him, to empower the saints, because as Jesus, Jesus was there 
supreme being and the son of God, he found it necessary to capacitate the saints so that when the saints are capacitated in the right way, when the saints are well emancipated by the kings of the, by the things of the heavenly kingdom and the power of the heavenly kingdom and the glory of the heavenly kingdom, they would not seek to push each other around for power. They would not seek to push each other around for glorification. They would not seek to push each other around for self-righteousness. They would not seek to hate each other, even in church, because of power, kingdom, and glory. Because one of the most difficult situations we are in, in church even today, in this pandemic, it is that the coronavirus has shown us how insignificant this power and glory that we've been chasing for the rest of our lives. How insignificant this entire kingdom that we've been chasing all the time. How insignificant our church positions being the vice chair or the bishop or the archbishop or secretary elect or the coordinator or second steward for that matter. All of those things are insignificant. The, the, the scientists can't find the right formula to kill coronavirus. I'm a quiet, I mean that the witch doctors can't find any, any muti to help coronavirus, right? Oh, pastor, petrol doesn't help anymore. Grass doesn't help anymore. Piano and organ doesn't help anymore. Umpampampa na makubu, noyana, noyana, pezulu doesn't help anymore. And so what is reigning now at the moment is the supreme being of the heavenly kingdom with all of his power. And in the end, none of us will claim the glory of what is happening now because each and every one of us is praying just for breathing. Everyone prays that, oh Lord, am I breathing well? Am I breathing fine? It may happen that next morning or in your sleep, you may lose your breath. Because you are in the heavenly kingdom. You do not have the power to hold or release your breath. And this thing that you've been chasing all your lives is actually in vain. The money you've been chasing, the fame you've been chasing, the glory you've been chasing, the power you've been chasing is all in vain today. And so for you and me, Mfunzu Kamza, Mfunzu Majela, Mfunzu Mbata, and many other people whom are tasked with the things of the heavenly kingdom, our duty at the moment and nothing else is to capacitate the saints. Our duty is not to chase the people and ask for money. Our duty is to teach the people how to pray the right prayer so that when they pray the right prayers in the right way, then they will know how to bring all that is necessary into the kingdom of God. And so our duty today and we we were taught by Uyesu, by the Lord's Prayer, was to teach the saints, capacitate the saints, empower the saints, and tell the saints of the glorious important things, so that when the people get the grasp of what it is to pray into, to pray God sincerely, right, and in truth, Christ met the woman by the well, okay, and in their debate, in their debate, they debated about the, the, the locations of where each one of them were allowed to pray. Others, well, and then other, the other says, no, 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 the Jewish uh, people worship there, that other side, and we pagans and, and, and um, Samaritans worship on the other side, and all those kind of things. And then Christ says, the time has come for God to be worshipped in truth and in, in, in all honesty, right? Because in his kingdom, nothing else matters because it is his kingdom. And if you are struggling by anything, understand that you are struggling of the things of God. If you are trying to fight any battle, it is not your battle. It is Mfuni Supunoi who says there is God's war and then is, there is your war. God will allow you to fight your war in your own kingdom. And when you are tired and consumed by fighting your own battle in your own way, you retreat and then God in his kingdom he takes over the battle. And so our duty as a people of God on this earth and the people who are tasked with preaching the gospel is to capacitate the saints of the important things of God. And so I always make this illustration in closing, Funzu Kamsa. I always make this, this illustration. 
that let's not be like the disciples of Jesus. Maybe we should be the disciples. By definition, the disciples, the disciples must are apprentice, okay, by definition. And so, but we need to have a different attitude from that which the disciples had. Which for the better part of their time, until Jesus went to the cross, they did not comprehend with what he was doing. That includes the people whom he had taught at the mount. They crucified him. They said, They, they seek glory and power for themselves. And so my illustration is always this, that as the saints, we need to understand that we are like midwives. That is in conclusion. We are like midwives. Midwives are those people who work at maternity ward. Okay? One, as a midwife, I understand this, that you cannot just be appointed and taken to maternity ward. You've got to be skilled and trained and, and be capacitated to do the kind of work that is required at, 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 the, at, at, at the section that you're working on, right? That's one. And then number two is that before a midwife gets into theater, she or he prepares all what is going to be needed at the theater, okay? And so by the time the doctors get there, the tables are set, everything is in order. And everything, when the time has come, ready to go, young in the corner and get hung up. Okay, that's who we are. One, we need to be well trained. Well trained is by reading scripture, practice. And I don't mean going to seminar, I don't mean doing theology, I don't mean I don't mean having big English and stuff like that, or having many degrees. No. I mean prayer itself is an exercise of connecting with what you are capacitated or you need to be doing. And so you capacitate yourself through prayer. And then, sec and then secondary to that is that the sole purpose of a midwife is to deliver babies. Okay? The sole purpose of a midwife is to deliver babies. And so delivering babies, they receive babies. They have to make sure that the baby that they have delivered is well and alive. Hence, they will take it and, 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 and beat it or do whatever that is necessary for the baby to, to cry. Okay, And so that's one of the, what, 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 what they are expected to do, to deliver babies and make it a point that the baby is well. However, what they need to have in mind and understand is that delivering good babies is not for their glorification or for their reward. It is the duty bestowed upon them by virtue of being trained, by virtue of being capacitated, by virtue of going through all the necessary requirements to be at the labor ward, right? They must understand that Secondary to that is that they must check the baby if it is fine. And not only the baby, they must also check the mother if the mother is fine. If the baby is breathing well and the mother is breathing well. So that when the mother receives the baby, she receives it in good health. And they understand that the babies that they are delivering are not theirs and for their possession. And are not for their, their good uh, oh man, whatever the case you want to be, the babies belong to a mother and a father. The only duty for them was, there, was that they need to be there with all the things. And so when I say we have been capacitated to become midwives, we have been taught through the Lord's Prayer that what we are to do as Christians, we need to forever be mindful of the fact that it is not ours. It is for the one who is supreme above everything on earth. And secondary to that is that we've got to be skilled in working in the kingdom. If you exist in the kingdom, that thing the Methodist calls um, priesthood of all believers because you in your own way and your own capacity, you are the priest in the kingdom of God. And so you exist 
in the kingdom of God for the other people. You are because they are. Okay, it's not because it's not they are because you are. No, no, no. You are because they are. And so for you and me is to discharge the heavenly kingdom and the heavenly gifts and everything that God has God has given us for the betterment of His kingdom. And so the babies in front of that we are called to deliver. We must be mindful of the fact that they are not our babies. The only thing we are tasked with doing is making the point that they are fine and those that they belong to is fine. And so we shall not get um, we should not seek to be glorified by other people. We should not seek no one quite here. Once we figure like we point at him, we tell and the have let out. I've been working for this church for, for a long time, spending my money and my airtime and everything and all my time here. And not a single person says to me, Thank you, Mfundis. Then you must understand that you are for your own glorification. I have been a steward here for 25 years and not a single person that has said thanks to me. I spent my money, I spent, I left my children and stuff like that to work for these people and these people don't even say thank you to me. No, 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 no. Understand this, that this is not for your glory. It is for the glory of the one whom you exist in. Remember Paul says, it is not I that lives in Christ, it is Christ that lives in me. And I want to conclude this thing by saying, the Lord's prayer the Lord's Prayer and even prayer itself, it is the only tool that you and me as people existing in the kingdom of God, that we shall gain power over the demons, that we shall gain power of the principalities of this world, that we shall gain power of the evil forces. Because remember this thing as I conclude in Funzu Kanza, this line thy kingdom come thy, I mean that yes, yes for thine is thy kingdom thy power and thy glory comes exactly after the line that says and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil meaning that this person the person who thought of including this thing that for thine is thy kingdom understood this thing that there is a lot of temptation that we go through we are tempted to want to be powerful we are tempted to receive glory which is all if we are tempted to do wrong things lead us not into temptation and so lead us not into doing things that are against against the principles of the kingdom of God lead us not against the evil that lead us this thing says in, in, in this thing says lead us into doing good do no harm and observe all God's ordinances lead us into understanding that in itabile to ailola nyamana gazi we are not fighting a war we are not in a battle of flesh and blood but we are in the battle of the spirit and so when we get tempted to amass wealth of this world when we get tempted to be corrupt in government when we get tempted to exploit the poor when we get tempted to exploit even our congregants and foolish when we get tempted to do the wrong things when when we get tempted to be promiscuous, when we get tempted right, to kill, when we get tempted to abuse women, when we get tempted, when we get tempted not to do the right things, Lord, please lead us not into that kind of temptation and deliver us from that evil because that which we exist in is not of our own making and it is not of our own doing. It is thy kingdom and the power that we seek so much, the power that we kill each other for, it is not our power but thy power is enormous with the glorification the clapping of hands when they preach well and everything else when people say well, well done you are the cleverest of the clever ministers and you are the cleverest of the clever scientists or whatsoever and you walk around uh, uh, telling people who I am Nyumba do you know who I am that kind of glory is not your glory. And so when this thing for thine is thy kingdom comes directly after lead us not into temptation, it is because there is a fine line, saints, there is a fine line between us seeking things of the earthly kingdom and us having understanding of the concept of the heavenly kingdom. There is a fine line between corruption and doing good. There is a fine line between life 
and truth. There is a fine line between seeking our personal glory. And understand this thing that when it says that is the kingdom, the power and the glory, it means that prayer on its own is the best tool ever that you can ever use to conquer every other battle that you are fighting with. Others are boasting by their chariots and horses and we mention the name of God because power is not ours. It is prayer, it is prayer, it is prayer that released Peter from four walls of, of, of the jail when he was taken by by Unir, by Uerot, I mean, right? Peter was taken into jail, right? And when he was taken, that is Acts chapter 12, right? When he was taken into jail, okay? And the only thing that the saints could do, the church could do, uh, in the upper room, Claude John Mark, right? They pray. It says, they got together in prayer. They sang day in and day out. They prayed day in and day out until the angel came and tapped Peter on the shoulder and said, the angel led Peter from the first thick wall and, and the first thick door of the prison and the second door and the third door and it took him around the corner and left him and when it left him around the corner only then he realized that the chains had fallen the prison doors had opened and he broke free from the kingdom of this world and went in mass into his into, in, into the heavenly kingdom and so when he approached the brethren at where they were praying even they could not be Believe that he was released because they did not believe that he could be released from such a, 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 a thick and cruel system that he was kept at under. And so prayer, prayer, prayer is the only weapon. It is the only weapon that can release us from captivity on the earthly kingdom. And it is the only thing that can release us from the power. It is the only thing. It is the only thing. And so, and so sometimes we may be released without even doing anything. But just by recognizing that this is not our own kingdom. And so, don't fight is not the town who comes and believe that this is what comes. No, they're not. They are of the godly kingdom. Don't seek power in your workplace and everywhere else. Understand that it is God's power. Don't seek to be glorified by the people of this world. Because today is a quarrel and tomorrow we take off the ladder. Because glory belongs to God. And so this, this other church prayed uh, that a tavern nearby. Mfuzu Kamsa once served in a society, M. Danzan. I came after him. Um, right across the road there was a tavern that had a jukebox. And so my, my little girl would wake me up every day, every morning at 3 a.m. and say, did you, call them, call, did you go tell them to close that thing off? Okay. It was that kind of situation that I'm trying to make, to make, to make an illustration of. And so, and so um, this church, not the church that we were in, the other church, prayed that that tavern would be closed down. And then eventually the tavern was closed for whatever reason. And then the owner of the tavern went to court. Uh, to lay charges against the church that this church had prayed that his tavern should should close down and it eventually closed down. Then the church hired an attorney to defend the case against the tavern owner. Now listen carefully to this. The tavern owner says this church prayed for my tavern to close down. And I could not keep it open. That's all. And then the church hires an attorney to defend the case. Meaning that a church that understands itself as being in the kingdom would know and understand its power of prayer and would not seek to defend itself against the attacks of the earthly kingdom. Because the reason why churches are not growing and the reason why we are not growing, it is because we don't believe so much in how much power has in our prayers. And we don't believe so much what our prayers could do. And I'm challenging you, friends, 
and I'm challenging everyone that one, capacitate yourself with prayer and two, understand that this that we are in, when you seek everything from God, just like the disciples, don't seek it for your own righteousness. Seek it for the glorification of God. So that when the power is bestowed upon you, glory then becomes God's glory and you gain the rewards of God's glory. And lastly, don't worry about the things of this world, but worry about your existing, existence in God's kingdom. Worry about the amount of power in your hands. Is it liberating? Is it oppressive? Worry when people glory. When comes, when Evan was Calvary says to you, you are the best minister ever. You need to look behind you and see if God is smiling on that. Because it may just happen that you are the best minister in the people of Calvary and the worst minister at home. It may be that you are the best steward at Calvary and the worst mother or father at home. It may be you are the best manager at work and the worst of those from those who need to, whom you need to give them love. And when he says, for thine is the kingdom, in your workplace, know that that's not your work. That's God's work. When you are upraised, know that you are upraised. The power is not yours. It is God's power. When you are given accolades, know that glory is not yours. Glory is for God. Amen. Us loving and compassionate God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the God who calls, the God who sends out. When I'm going to see our who had eyes but could not see. Who had ears but could not hear, who had legs but could not walk. When I go see how far in Ochigo, Ababe Kuchwa Pan there, La Pumilang, 